Good morning. My name is Mitch Wonder from Department of the Treasury Office of Cybersecurity and Critical Infrastructure Protection. I want to invite you today to an informal discussion hosted by Treasury and NIST on the Treasury Cybersecurity Framework version 2.0. We are hosting this event because NIST uh, asked us as the sector risk management agency for the financial services sector to see if we could get some more engagement by uh, small to mid-sized financial sector firms. And uh, we're delighted that so many firms have decided to uh, invest their time this morning to give this feedback. Uh, before we go right into NIST, uh, Rochelle Frazier, also from our office, is going to give uh, some information on uh, how to ask questions and interact with the presenters. Thank you. Hi, Mitch. Thank you. Uh, hello again, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we really appreciate everyone coming out, your willingness and your helpfulness. So I'm just going to go over some quick, more logistical sort of aspects of how this works. As you noticed um, in the attendee position, uh, you can't mute or unmute on your own. Uh, so what you need to do, if you would like to speak, if you would like to chime in, some sort of commentary, which is what this is. It's a very informal discussion to help NIST gain some feedback on the cybersecurity framework. What you do is use the Zoom function of raise your hand. If you look at your bottom panel, um, you should be able to see that there's a little three dots and it says more and it gives you the option to raise your hand. If you raise that, it will inform us that somebody would like to speak and we will go through, we'll get a list of how you raise your hand in order. So we will go through that. Um, for phone in, for dial in individuals, you should have the option to also uh, push some buttons. I'm not quite sure what they are, but it will give you the option of please push these buttons to inform the host that you would like to speak. Uh, but in addition to that, to keep the discussion flowing, to keep everything flowing, if you also look at your bottom, if you are on the Zoom web, the Zoom app, there is a Q&A uh, box here and if you hit it it pops up with Q&A and it will give all participants the opportunity to type in questions. Um, everybody in the webinar will be able to see it and it also gives all of the panelists, all of the hosts the ability to answer questions as they come in, uh, answer them live or even type up and respond to an answer. Um, so we highly recommend utilizing the Q&A feature over the chat feature. Um, I know it's instinct to go to chat if you have a question, if you want to say something. Things can get very, very lost in the chat. There's no way to really keep up with it. But with the Q&A feature, there is a very formal, structured way of keeping track of questions, keeping track of comments, keeping track of your input, um, which is what NIST is really going for with this discussion. And then also with the ability to raise your hand. That way we know who wants to speak, who still needs to speak, and we can kind of just keep a more organized flow on this. So uh, again, Q&A feature, raise your hand. Those are the main logistical parts of this. Um, if you have any questions, you can use the chat feature to message me, Rochelle Fraser, and I will do my best to help you kind of as it happens. Uh, so this time, I'm actually going to turn it over now to uh, Sherry so that she can begin, and I'll hand it over to Ness. Great. Thanks, Rochelle. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks um, to all those at Treasury for organizing this meeting today. We really appreciate um, your support in, in hosting this and, and, and thanks so much for the opportunity to talk to you all today about the NIST cybersecurity framework and our plans to update it. Um, I am Sherry Pasco. I'm a senior technology policy advisor at NIST. Um, I also lead the NIST cybersecurity framework program and will be overseeing it through the update as we move towards um, the next version of the framework. I've got a couple of colleagues with me that will help with all of the um, um, difficult questions. I think, as Rochelle mentioned, this is your opportunity to ask questions of us while you've got us. Um, so please don't hesitate to to use the, um, the Q&A um, um, function to insert your, your comments, your questions. And, and I think given that we have about um, 350 folks 
on the, online today will probably um, defer to those that that write um, written questions to, to unmute you guys first um, um, so that we can keep things organized. Um, and Rochelle is reminding me that um, this presentation is being recorded. Um, and so that means that I, um, there's a disclaimer that needs to be provided that no views presented today are reflected of the Treasury Department. I will turn it over to um, my next colleague from NIST, um, Adam Sedgwick, to introduce himself. Thank you. Um, my name is Adam Sedgwick. I am a uh, also senior policy advisor at NIST. Um, I've been at NIST um, for over 10 years and actually been uh, involved with the CSF uh, since uh, the development of the executive order that created it. So I'm um, looking forward to the discussion today. Thanks. Connie. Hi, my name is Connie LaSalle. I'm also a senior technology policy advisor within the NIST IT lab. Um, I, Sherry's basically my boss on, on CSF uh, and I focus my time on, on many other topics related to cybersecurity, privacy um, and technology trust issues in general. So looking forward to the conversation and thanks so much for the robust attendance. I'm hoping we make it to, to maybe 400, is that feasible? Um, but anyway, back to Sherry. Thank you. Amy. Thanks, Sherry. And hi, everyone. My name's Amy Mon, and I'm an international policy specialist at NIST, and I lead our international engagement around the cybersecurity framework and some of our standards development efforts in this area. Really looking forward to the discussion today and appreciate the chance to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Jeff. Sure, thank you. I seem to be having trouble with video. I apologize for that. Uh, my name is Jeff Marin. I work on well, quite a few projects at NIST, but uh, primarily for our discussion today, I help um, with our outreach to small and medium businesses for cybersecurity assistance. So looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff and Greg. Good morning. I'm Greg Witt. I'm a contractor supporting NIST. I've been working with the cybersecurity framework from the beginning of 1.0, and I see a lot of names in the attendees list that, that worked with us on building that. So looking forward to 2.0 and happy to help answer any questions we have. Thanks, Greg. Well, I wanted to make sure that, that you guys knew the team. Um, you're always welcome to contact us after this presentation and, and continue the conversation. Um, I will also kind of describe some other ways that that you can get engaged in in um, our efforts at NIST, including the you know update for the cybersecurity framework. Um, all of the efforts at NIST are are really stakeholder driven, and and so we really couldn't do this without you. Um, we want to make sure that our resources. Are, are helpful to you, that they are effective and, and relevant for the challenges that you're facing today. And, and so really appreciate the time that you're taking today to discuss with us. Um, and, and so I will, I have a quick presentation before we get um, into questions, just going over um, a bit about the cybersecurity framework. So um, as you may know, I mean, NIST has been in the cybersecurity business for the past 50 years. We're actually celebrating our anniversary this year um, and we're, we're hosting a number of um, blogs and, and workshops to celebrate our 50th anniversary. So um, this is a good opportunity to, to hear um, about all the different work that NIST has done and, 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 and we're trying to make it um, more available and increase the awareness of, of the different cybersecurity resources that we have. Um, I think as we all know, um, um, and, and I'm sure Treasury's hosted a number of these on cybersecurity, you know, cybersecurity risks are continuing to evolve and grow. 
you know, um, technologies are changing, the cybersecurity standards landscape are changing. Um, we want to make sure that our resources um, are evolving as well so that we provide, you know, the best guidance, um, some good best practices to help you um, tackle those risks and feel comfortable that you have um, the resources to do so. Um, throughout this presentation, I really want to make sure that we understand, you know, what your biggest concerns with cybersecurity are, you know, the, the old question of what's keeping you up at night. So, so feel free to share those um, in the chat in the Q&A as we go through this presentation. This spring, we, um, we started a request for information to review our resources and ask for feedback um, on, on that question that I raised, you know, are our cybersecurity resources effective and relevant to address the current, current challenges? Um, this publishes a lot of guidance um, and, and we wanna make sure that they're meeting the need Um, based off of that request for information, NIST made a decision to update the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, the framework was first published in 2014. Um, it was last updated in 2018 um, with, with a version 1.1 about four years ago. Um, and now we've started the process again to you know, update um, version 2.0 to account for, for the evolving cybersecurity landscape. Just a little background on the cybersecurity framework. I, I, I know many of you have probably been involved with, with the framework from the beginning, um, and, and we really appreciate your support and involvement in the process. I think for those that are newer, um, this might be a little bit helpful to sometimes understand the way that NIST talks about it. So the framework um, is um, kind of viewed as foundational you know, to addressing cybersecurity risks, it does so by providing a set of cybersecurity outcomes. These are the end results that we hope organizations will meet to address cybersecurity risks. It is not a list of controls. It does not tell an organization how to meet each outcome. And thus it's meant to be paired, you know, with more um, prescriptive standards as well as various control frameworks that an organization would leverage to meet each outcome. Um, and I see in the chat, you know, a, a mention of um, NIST 853 security and privacy controls. That's an example of an informative reference that organizations would use to, to implement the cybersecurity framework outcomes. Um, that outcome-based approach you know, we, we've heard has been really helpful for creating, you know, the cybersecurity taxonomy, a common language across sectors, as well as across organizations. Um, it can help to improve um, communication with non-IT experts, you know, between business leaders and C-suite and IT professionals within an organization, um, between, you know, the organization and your third parties, um, as well as between your organization and maybe with your um, regulators or your sector risk management agencies. Um, it is risk-based, and that means that each sector and each organization you know, may vary in the way that they implement it. Um, and as a highly regulated sector, you know, the, the, the financial sector um, has taken some steps to kind of tailor the framework for um, the various kind of sector specific standards that exist, as well as the sector specific regulations that you might be subject to. Um, some of the kind of initial categories within the cybersecurity framework are found within the, um, the identify function, which kind of directs organizations to identify its business environment, your regulatory and legal risks and other kind of governance related roles and responsibilities to kind of prepare your organization to address cybersecurity risks and address some of the other functions of the framework. We've certainly seen um, a tailoring in the financial sector with, with the financial sector profile that was developed by CIR, CRI and, and uh, originally by the Physic. Um, CRI is the nonprofit that has taken over ownership 
of the cybersecurity framework financial sector profile. Um, and they've done a lot of the heavy lifting to kind of incorporate you know, sector specific standards and regulations into its profile. So um, we really wanna hear from you, you know, about whether you're currently using the framework, kind of what other cybersecurity frameworks and standards are you using as well in, in conjunction with the framework. So a little bit about the update and, and the direction that we're moving with CSF 2.0. Um, as I mentioned, um, we, we did a request for information um, in the spring. Um, we, we published a, a summary analysis um, of all of the different comments that we heard, 140 comments across a wide variety of stakeholders. Um, and these themes will drive our, um, our efforts um, as we move towards CSF 2.0. Um, we certainly heard quite a bit from organizations that they like the framework, that they currently find it effective to manage cybersecurity risks. Um, but of course, you know, given the evolving landscape, stakeholders had a lot of comments about the ways in which the framework um, can be improved going forward, as well as how to increase its usage um, by all organizations you know, not just critical infrastructure, which the framework was originally developed for, but also, you know, increasing its usage and adoption internationally by foreign governments, um, increasing the usage um, at the state and local and tribal level um, by academia, as well as um, by um, increasing the usage by small and medium sized organizations. So really trying to make it make sure that it is valuable for many different types of organizations. Uh, there was um, certainly um, a number of kind of topical issues that were also raised in the RFI, such as, you know, considering um, um, increasing discussion of cybersecurity governance, um, you know, cloud computing and IoT technology adoption, supply chain cybersecurity software, um, secure software acquisition, you know, cybersecurity measure mint and metrics. These are all topics that are being discussed kind of in the cybersecurity space generally beyond the framework but we're certainly taking a look to see how and whether, you know, we can increase the discussions of each of these within the updated framework. We're also taking a really close look at um, the guidance that we are providing um, to organizations and implementing the framework. Um, we, we certainly want to maintain the, the flexibility um, and the um, shortness that, that people have praised about the framework, but um, we recognize that some organizations may need additional guidance in implementing the framework. Um, the first step that we are taking is kind of increasing awareness of existing resources that, that um, already um, exist to implement the framework. You know, that's things like the sample profiles that I mentioned, um, as well as, you know, other resources that are, that are found on our website. So, um, you know, just, just sharing um, a couple of links, um, some light bedtime reading on, you know, for you on how to implement the cybersecurity framework. Um, all of these links can be found on the NIST framework website. Um, but the first link I wanted to share is called our quick start guide. Um, this kind of summarizes some of the initial steps organizations can take to implement the framework categories and subcategories. You know, it's really short, only a couple of pages, um, and it's a really nice um, place to start. There's also a handful of sector specific resources that we've posted on our website. Um, I mentioned the CRI profile. I've got a link here and, and, and um, I, I think that uh, we'll make sure that that is also shared in, in the Q&A. Um, there's also a number of um, kind of small business resources 
you know, including our full NIST Small Business Cybersecurity Corner, which is our website dedicated to sharing a whole bunch of different small business cybersecurity resources, um, including those developed by NIST, but also um, other agencies, um, including, you know, the FTC and, and, and uh, the Small Business Administration and CISA. Um, and so I think you'll find um, some really great resources um, on our website, but, but wanted to identify a couple here that I think would be um, most valuable. So here's a little bit about kind of how to get engaged in the update process. Um, as you can see from introductions, we've got a pretty small team at NIST working on this. And so the way that NIST always develops our resources is we kind of leverage the expertise of the community. Um, and, and so we're hosting events like this. Um, we're also hosting um, larger public workshops. We had our first workshop the other month. Um, and we recently, um, if you were unable to attend, we just published a summary analysis of that workshop on our website, as well as the full recordings of the day. Um, we're really thrilled with the involvement in that workshop. Um, we attracted a very large audience, about 4,000 people across 100 countries, um, and we hope to continue that involvement um, as we move forward with the update. Um, we also intend to publish drafts of the updated framework for public comment. Um, and so certainly encourage you to participate over the next year um, as we move forward with, with this framework update. We wanna make sure that it is reflective of the cybersecurity challenges that you're facing um, and making sure that it is usable by my, many different organizations. Um, the framework had you know, a lot of initial momentum due to kind of heavy stakeholder engagement when we were first developing the framework. Um, people talk a lot about, you know, the half a dozen workshops around the country back in 2014 during the initial development of the framework and, and, and how important um, that collaboration was to, you know, not only the development of the framework, but also advancement of, of cybersecurity. Um, we're striving to kind of duplicate that again, um, as well as expanding our outreach even further. Um, obviously with COVID, we are a little bit more constrained in the type of public events, in-person public events that we can do. And so we're really trying to rely on, um, you know, Zoom and, and Teams and things like this um, to reach organizations um, and have a conversation about, you know, the cybersecurity risks that you're facing and how we can improve the framework. Um, so um, that's just our quick overview. Please, um, I've included our, um, our email address for um, reaching the team at NIST on the cyber framework, as well as our website, um, which outlines kind of all of the different ways in which you can engage. So, um, you know, please um, check those out and, and don't hesitate after this meeting to, to stay in touch. Let me see if I can stop sharing my screen. Okay, I think it's stopped. Is that true? Yes, it is. Yeah. So, uh, Rochelle, looks like we have one person who's ready to speak. If you want to uh, unmute them, we can take that question. There yep. are, yeah, I've Chloe. given them the ability. Uh, Chloe, if you want to unmute your mic, you should be able to speak.
Uh, Chloe, we can't we can't hear you if you're speaking. Chloe, oh. <laughs> it looks like she, it looks like Chloe did not actually mean to raise their hand. So oh, okay. <laughs> um, maybe we can, it looks like we've been typing some answers to some of the questions, but while folks um, think about um, other comments that they wanna make and, and feel free to raise your hand um, if you'd like to be called on. Um, there's one um, um, about um, at what, from Anthony, at what point does 853 security and privacy controls in the CSF merge? Um, I think, as I mentioned, you know, and, and, and Jeff um, correctly states that there are a different level of abstractions. You know, the 853 controls are um, one way in which an organization can meet the, um, the CSF outcomes. And, and the nice thing about the 853 controls is they also have um, associated guidance on, on how to um, um, you know, measure whether you've implemented the control, which is a nice um, addition um, for the folks that are interested in, in measurement. Um, but, you know, the 853 controls um, have existed for a um, long time, much longer than the cybersecurity framework, and, and we are hesitant to kind of redo the order of those. Every time we make a change to those, there's a really uh, significant process um, that goes, that we go through, but we are looking um, now that we have, you know, an opportunity to update the framework to see if if there are areas in which um, we can increase the alignment between um, the 853 controls and, and the NIST cybersecurity framework outcomes that are at a higher level of abstraction for those controls. Um, I will note, um, Adam mentioned um, a, a, a link to OLEAR. Um, we um, um, have a number of, of um, informative references for the framework. You know, 853 is just one example, but there's other standards and other control frameworks that that the cybersecurity framework is mapped to. There's there's a, um, a column specifically for informative references in the framework that was published in 2018. And obviously, um, you know, quickly kind of became out of date. Um, and so that's why we developed this database called OLEAR, um, where um, we can continue to kind of keep those informative references fresh and have kind of standardized ways of mapping, you know, different types of standards to the framework. So I encourage you to check that out. We're also looking at um, um, different ways to um, portray the information that's in OLEAR, but um, you, can, you can download various Excels um, that, that show the mapping of the cybersecurity framework to a number of different um, standards and, and, and guidance and other resources. And then um, there was some questions about, um, you know, different links um, for how to stay in touch, um, as well as um, for the CRI profile, Greg graciously included all of those links there. Definitely feel free to sign up for our um, CSF email subscription link. That's that what we use to send out our gov deliveries. And that's what we will be using to, you know, send out um, um, announcements about our future workshops, as well as the CSF 2.0 drafts for public comment. Um, so feel free to, to sign up for those. So I think while we are waiting for um, additional questions or folks to raise their hands, um, I think 
Um, Amy has volunteered to talk a little bit about um, the international aspects of the cybersecurity framework. That's a really important goal for us as we move forward with, with the framework. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Amy. Thanks, Sherry. And as noted in Sherry's great overview, one of the areas we heard from stakeholders about during this RFI process was the importance of international engagement on the cybersecurity framework, as well as the importance of continuing to align to international standards, particularly the ISO 27000 series. So just wanted to spend a few moments talking a little bit about what we have done so far with international engagement and the kind of a robust engagement we're hoping to increase in the future through this update process. Framework has already been adapted quite widely internationally since first coming out in 2014. Countries like Italy and Israel, Japan, who put it into national policy. Japan was actually the first to translate it. And Mary noted we have a couple of international translations now, up to about nine, I believe. And that's been very important for us to be able to make the framework a globally accessible resource. And having those translations has been helpful to us. We have Spanish and Portuguese ones as well, thanks to our friends at the State Department. And they've also helped us with translating some of the resources associated with the framework, like the quick start guide that Sherry talked about and one of our ransomware profiles and some other resources. So that's been helpful as well, particularly with engagement in the Latin America region. We've talked about the framework <clears throat> broadly in international forums like OECD and the Organization of American States. And those organizations now have some resources that reference and reflect the framework and having that opportunity to work with stakeholders and share information on the risk-based approach to the framework has really helped us as we've updated it through the years and will be very helpful for this update process moving forward. We also, as noted, continue a lot of work in standards development organizations, such as ISO, where this has actively contributed to the development of two different resources that reference the framework and those five functions in the category language. One is a technical reference document and one is a recently released technical specification that has guidance to develop a cybersecurity framework mentions the five functions and a lot of the language that's been modified a bit through that open and transparent collaborative approach of standards development. But since it doesn't say NIST or US government, we hope that will be a useful tool or resource for those who might not pick up something because it's US government, but they will look at it because it's from ISO. We want to continue that approach, also participating in editing a project for a different standard that now also has some language referencing the framework. So still very open to other ways we can continue this international standards alignment and also appreciate any feedback on where we might be able to go with this international engagement and continue strengthening that. We have really value the conversations we've had with our partners, both in government and industry internationally, and very much look to get more of that feedback from them during this update process and really ensure that the framework is something that's global and can apply not just in the US, but throughout the world. Thanks, Sherry. I'll stop there, but happy to answer any questions people might have on those international aspects. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, and I see we've got a question from Daniel asking to summarize the major changes between 2.0 and 1.0. So we um, have not yet published 2.0. Um, um, the themes that I discussed are kind of the, the direction in which we you know, intends to go for 2.0. We expect that um, um, 2.0 will probably not come out until um, at earliest the fall or winter of next year. Um, so we expect to use kind of the next year to work with um, really with you, with everyone on, on the changes that you would like to see to the framework. Um, we also think that this is a great opportunity, as Amy mentioned, um, as we're talking about changes to the framework to increase the usage of the framework. And so we're doing a lot of events um, focused on awareness, focused on um, training, um, on you know, how to use the framework and an increasing awareness of, of different resources um, that are available to use and implement the framework. So Sherry, maybe I'll I'll chime in and, and maybe take this up a level just to ask what are what are folks' biggest challenges 
whether it's related to cybersecurity or otherwise. Um, I think that'll that'll help us better understand, you know, maybe what what portions of the update to highlight for you. Um, you know, for example, I know that resources <laughs> tends to come up whether you are um, a small credit union or you are a large multinational. Um, so if, if folks could just pepper in the chat or even in the Q&A function, like what's the biggest challenge right now? Has the pandemic shifted the way that you are forced to operate? Um, and has that resulted in, in secondary challenges? And I'll just give folks a minute to, to think and provide their, their answers if they could. Thanks, Connie. Um, and maybe while we wait, I would also want to bring up one other aspect of um, not just the um, framework update, but really a, a key project we have at, at NIST and some of the resources that we've been developing, and that's really around privacy. Um, when we were developing the cybersecurity framework, the uh, executive order required us to um, have a methodology for privacy and civil liberties. Um, and the approach we took in the initial cybersecurity framework and through the update was to um, really look at some of the risks um, to and opportunities for privacy uh, in a cybersecurity program. Um, where are the places that you can do joint training? Where do you have similar personnel? Um, and then, uh, but then also where are the things you can do that might be good for your cybersecurity program, but might inadvertently introduce privacy risk. Uh, over monitoring your customers or employees, things of that nature. Um, but in the course of the last few years, we developed a freestanding document, um, which is its own privacy framework that takes the form of the privacy of the cybersecurity framework with the um, core and the tiers and the profile of those concepts, but uh, builds it out to be very privacy specific. Um, really to look at that Venn diagram that goes beyond data security and other things that organizations can do, not just to comply with privacy law, but really manage privacy as a risk, just like we do with cybersecurity, financial and reputational risk. Um, that team has also been developing resources for small and medium businesses. They have their own quick start guide. Um, they're working on uh, a privacy uh, risk uh, professionalization program, looking at workforce needs. Um, but then another question during this update is to make sure that um, those two frameworks remain aligned and we have good privacy material in the cybersecurity framework. So just another area that I really, we really welcome a discussion and another thing that's a, a big priority for us here. So it looks like we have a few folks who have um, responded via the Q&A function about challenges. So thanks. I'll just go through and read some of these. Um, so Dennis says the biggest challenge on our end is our reliance on third party vendors. We can control our environment, but we cannot control third party vendors. Some of the biggest vendors are just not responsive to smaller financial institutions. And it looks like we have a plus one from Matthew. Does that resonate with other folks? You can just say, you know, verbally or, or add your response to the Q&A. Arresty plus one, Brenda says yes. So it's, oh man, okay, yeah, lots of concurrence. So this is a big one. And I imagine, you know, as you outsource to cloud vendors, this becomes a bigger and bigger challenge. Um, so that's interesting. Yep, yep, people keep saying yes. While people say plus one, Maybe let's go to the next note from Don Shields. Our biggest challenge is dealing with executives that have been hammered by vendors about ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. The fear factor is worse than the threat. That's interesting. I wouldn't, you know, it's hard to tell. There's been a lot of coverage of, of ransomware and certainly a focus by um, the highest levels of the federal US government on the, on the challenge. So it's interesting to hear that, um, that kind of challenge has not come to bear in reality, but the, <laughs> the, the thought of it and the risk of it seems to be top of mind for your executive. Yeah, and I, this, this doesn't necessarily help with the vendors overselling 
things, which is a, a common concern in the cybersecurity space. But I did want to point out one resource, which is we just published this year a cybersecurity framework profile specifically for ransomware. Um, and there is a um, quick start guide associated with that, which, which might be a really helpful um, you know, two pager that you can give to executives um, about, you know, all right, if you're actually looking to address ransomware, here are the top steps that you should take. Um, there's a lot of ransomware guidance out there, but um, for those um, that, are, that are specifically interested in, in tackling the, the um, ransomware concern and, and want to use, you know, the NIST cybersecurity framework as a way to kind of outline your approach. Um, certainly recommend um, that resource and, and I will um, add that to the chat. That's a great point. So I can keep going through the challenges unless somebody else wants to raise um, a question verbally. I don't see any hands up though. Okay. We have one from Kimberly. For many SMB that I've talked to, it's an issue with in-house ISO not having admin access whenever we do have, let's see, through thorough automated reporting, active IT steering committee. So it seems like this is more of a governance challenge. Um, plus, you know, availability of automated tools. Michael says, small financials are huge, are at a huge disadvantage with customer bias towards larger firms. We've moved to Cloudify. Oh, I like that. I haven't heard that verb before. Cloudify our network so that hopefully we can offload many of our cyber duties to Azure, et cetera. The more requirements and costs that are added, the more the playing field tilts to the large players. Yep. That sounds right. Um, and then Kathy notes that chat is disabled, but she's echoing the other comment about um, increasing reliance on third party vendors. It's a huge concern. Okay, that's really good to hear. And it's consistent, by the way, with um, smaller organizations across sectors. Um, they find that they are just, you know, customer number, you know, 20,000, whatever. Um, and they're not getting the, the kind of support that they, they would like. So not sure that makes you feel better, <laughs> but it's at least consistent with what I have heard from small and mediums. Um, let's see. And now it looks like there's a separate question about um, an update to 1805 IT asset management. I don't know if anybody on the NIST team wants to speak to that one or we can respond in the chat. Mm -hmm. That one's that would be a publication from the NCCOB. Mm -hmm. So that was I don't think those are typically updated unless the project has different builds they're, they're going through. So I don't believe there's been any update to that one. Okay. Uh, Connie, there is a question later on about um, identity, uh, specifically Ooh. about um, regulator uh, NIST. Um, speaking with regulators about our password guidance. Um, is that something you want to talk about, kind of where we are on our um, identity work? Sure. And I'm trying to scroll and, and find it, but um, I can give a general identity update, which is that um, our, our core piece of identity guidance is special publication 863. Uh, revision three was published probably been five years ago now. Um, there was one errata update, but for the most part, it's stayed as is for the last few years, but we're updating it. Uh, and we anticipate having uh, an update, a draft update published um, probably in the next month or so. And we'll have a similar, um, uh, what do you call it? A uh, public comment period that'll accompany it probably through the beginning of the, of the next calendar year. Um, okay, I see it from Adrian. Can this do something to get financial regulators up to speed with newer password requirements? There is no apparent adoption of newer NIST password guidelines. I'm seeing lots of plus ones. Um, so I'm going to take a note to specifically engage financial regulators and um, see what they have to say about our, our 863 
guidance and associated password guidelines. Thank you for yeah, that. I would say, yeah, I would say overall that update really does give us a good opportunity to engage with the technical community, but also the policy community to make sure that we're in, people are using it and uh, it's meaningful. Absolutely. Let's see. So Sherry, I don't know if you want me to just continue going through uh, the comments we've received. There are, there are lots of them. It seems like most people are, are having a challenge managing vendors um, or dealing with yeah. uh, supplier and third party risk. Yeah, I think that's, that's interesting because I think this area that you know we've been working on for a long time um, and really kind of stepped up our efforts um, in response to the recent executive order that focused on kind of secure um, software cybersecurity and, and, and supply chain cybersecurity. And so there's, there's some new guidance that we've updated on our supply chain guidance um, um, and secure software development guidance that federal agencies now have to follow. Um, so OMB has required um, the federal agencies implement that um, guidance. And, and, and so that is um, currently in, in process um, of, of you know, being implemented. Um, it's really new, but, but you know, the way that this will be implemented is largely through procurement. And, and so I think the thought was that um, we can kind of leverage the federal agencies buying and purchasing power to force vendors to to make changes to adopt you know secure software development best practices um, and kind of increase the supply chain of the federal government um, and obviously the federal government purchases you know the same um, a lot of the same um, um, IT and 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 um, that um, everyone else purchases. And, and so the hope is, is that, that um, you know, um, the rest of industry would be able to see some of the benefits that are pushed through by the federal government. Um, but it is, I, I, I do recognize the challenge that, that you guys are all facing because we can put out all of the best practices in the world and we can, we can say, you know, all of the things that organizations should be doing to, um, you know, ask of their vendors, but if the vendors are saying, sorry, you know, here's the price, that's the door, um, there's only so much that, that you guys can do. And so um, I don't know if anybody else wants to talk more about our, our supply chain cybersecurity efforts, but that's my thoughts. No, I mean, it's definitely a big topic for us that we've tried to address in a couple of different ways. It's probably worth sharing um, the link to the program page um, because the guidance has come historically in a variety of forms. Um, and supply chain is interesting one to track with the history of the CSF2, uh, where in the, in the original, um, it was left in the roadmap to kind of get to in the future because we knew it was a pressing issue, but we didn't think the standard, standard guidelines were in the right place. There weren't really best practices to pull from. Um, for the first update, we sort of squeezed it in um, and identify, um, realizing that a, a bigger update would be more difficult. And I think uh, with this update, we are really trying to think how to do better integration of supply chain throughout the framework um, because you know the world's really changed, and um, the dependencies on third party and the complexity of managing in the cloud with multiple vendors is, is just the reality right now. So, um, how do we how do we have better guidance? How do we help organizations with those challenges? How do we do it through, through procurement, as Sherry mentioned, but also the ongoing relationships after you procure these services? And then I think you know, from the perspective of small and mediums. Uh, many of you guys, you know, how do we make it so that we can really uh, allow collective action, right? So if, if, if people are banding together and coming up with some more requirements, how do you share those back out to say, you know, this is a common expectation that we have for people delivering these services. Um, those are all kind of some of the tools that we want to start providing in addition to the resources we already have. And I think it's going to be a big part of how we think about our, our cybersecurity program moving forward.
I want to ask um, Kathy if if you could expand on your uh, your comment about supply chain issues from the pandemic. Would you be willing to to unmute and expand a little bit? Kathy Allen, if you're still if you're still on, would you mind maybe sharing? Sure, maybe she can't unmute herself. Oh, uh, let's see. If she wants to. Or not. I don't need to call you out in front of you know oh, hundred. She's happy to do it. Rochelle, could you help us um unmute Kathy? Absolutely. Oh. What uh let me try and get to her. Kathy, could you use the raise hand function so that Rochelle yeah. can identify you? That'd be great. Oh, there we go. Perfect. There it is. Okay. You should be able to unmute now, Kathy. Great. I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so supply chain issues that we've been experiencing um, really kind of um, start even as small as just being able to get card stock for debit cards <laughs> all the way to, um, you know, one of our projects we started over almost a year ago is, um, you know, enhancing our disaster recovery posture by uh, putting a um, recovery site in our, our core vendors environment, which would require a router and, um, you know, internet connection to that site. So we can't get the router. Um, you know, we've uh, the vendor that we want to purchase it through. It's on back order and until this December. So that was about a year ago. We've been so we've been waiting for this, you know, to become available. So that's two of the main things that um, we're feeling right now. A lot of other little things too. Um, but yeah, just being able to get what we need to do, what we need to do. <laughs> And then of course, you know, we just went through an examination and examinations look at these projects too. Examiners are saying, why is this taking you so long? And it's like, it's not our fault, <laughs> you know, but um, you know, we're beholden to the vendors that we choose uh, to get us through these projects. Um, and it's been challenging for sure. Wow, I would not have thought of cardstock as, um... Your, you know, answer number one. That's. I'm glad I asked the question, and thank you so much for sharing. Anytime. Do you find that there are any helpful resources, tools, or even you know the the CSF in its current form that have helped you manage some of those vendor or supplier relationships? Um, I can't say specifically um, any tools. Um, I guess just um, going up the chain as far as you can um, with our vendors um, and being the squeakiest wheel, I, I think has helped us to get some of the things that we need. Um, some things we just can't help. Our vendors are just, you know, look, Cisco's too big to, to help us at this point. This is our, you know, our date when we can get you what you want, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say specifically. Yeah. That sounds really challenging. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for for sharing. Is there is there anything else while we have you unmuted since since that seems to be an, an ordeal unmuting people <laughs> that you want to share while you're <laughs> while you have the floor? Um, no, I, I, a couple of comments that I saw um, ring true for us too, that um, as far as aligning examiners with, you know, more recent, um, you know, protocols that are in practice that are actually better than, you know, like the password and um, mm. the, you know, just, I, I felt like when they were here recently, you know, we have some new um, things that we've implemented just to manage um, our vendor uh, vendor management, like a new software. And they, they just couldn't wrap their heads around, um, 
you know, how we were using it and how it was helping us manage our vendors. Um, it was really just a new software. Um, so they spent a lot of time digging in, in that area. Um, I think part of it was to do that they just were, didn't have IT people conducting the examination. So we did a lot of explaining, <laughs> which oh was um, time consuming and, you know, a lot of circling back, but um, we worked through it. And then I guess the other thing would be um, the third party uh, and cloud. We, that's just a huge concern because one, one commenter said, you know, that we just have no control over their environments and, you know, we can take their SOC reports and we can, you know, take their word for it, but it's still at the end of the day, that's what keeps me up at night is, you know, a breach with a vendor or a third party. And, you know, we just have no control over it. Right. Yeah, that has come up um, quite a bit, like I said, with um, organizations that have decided to fully shift over to one of those larger, or not even larger, but any cloud vendor. Um, and I think the threat of ransomware piece that has come up is really interesting. I almost, you know, I think for the health sector, they saw that for their mid-size organizations, um, they were particularly at risk because mm -hmm. they were large enough to be worth targeting, but not so large that they had um, the, the type of advanced information security program that a larger organization might. Right. And um, also I read that the healthcare industry was such a big target because, you know, they're, they're in the business of saving lives. So they're more willing right. to pay that ransom. <laughs> right. Well, and I would, I would wonder too, I mean, it's, it's, you know, for the financial services sector, you have a similar sort of hierarchy of needs, right? You need money to be able to pay for those healthcare services. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. I know we're, I don't wanna cut this conversation off because it's, it's heating up, but um, I think we're supposed to, to stop at 11. So Sherry, I didn't know if you wanted to, to pivot to another question or open the floor to, to someone else. You are able to go past 11 if you want. We don't have to stop at 11. We still have the, the time and the space. So you don't okay, have sorry. to hard stop at 11. Okay. Thank you, Rochelle. Thanks, Let Rochelle. me just say that I think I accidentally clicked on Dennis's Q&A about answering it live. Uh, he says, any focus in the new framework about segregation of networks? I was... I meant to type. I meant to hit the one where I type an answer. I thought, that isn't there already reg with by reg the framework very well? There's already uh, at least some sub a sub cat about segregation of networks. Is that right, Greg? Yes, it is. Yeah. In fact, it's one of the one of the subcategories that's there. But I think as things become more virtual, there's more opportunity to maybe expand on that. But yeah, absolutely. That's a really critical factor. Yeah. Um, it used to be we had a big castle wall and everything inside was was open game. So that's that's one thing NIST has worked really hard to try to try to focus on recently. So maybe it's a note to uh, I don't know maybe it's not prominent enough. I'm not sure. There's um there's a couple of other questions that were in the chat that I that I wanted to get to. Um, you know, there's one from. Brian, which I think Greg is trying to answer, which comes first, security policy or security program? Um, and, and I appreciate the chicken or egg um, scenario that's occurring there. I think, I, I think the one thing that I wanted to say is that if you're looking at the cybersecurity framework, um, you know, we, we have not necessarily kind of prioritized any of the functions within the cybersecurity framework, but if there is a function that is the most important, it would be the identify function. Um, that is um, the kind of set of activities that we would expect an organization would have to, um, to kind of implement in order to, you know, meet the rest of the functions of the framework. Um, those are things like identifying your governance policies, you know, determining who is um, responsible and for what, 
um, identifying kind of your business environment and, 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 and the, the, the kind of risk landscape that you sit in and kind of identifying what your priorities are. Um, and so, um, you know, security policies and security programs would obviously um, um, fall from that kind of initial kind of risk management governance type of type of activities that 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 organizations would have to do to 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 kind of develop those those policies in that program. I don't know, Greg, if you had a no, I can't see how you responded. No. You oh, no, that's fine. I think I think you, you, <laughs> you answered it very well. Uh, I. I would say one of the things that we've learned in our work in the risk management over the years is that it is kind of a chicken and egg, as you said, but if, if you can start with understanding what your leadership and managers expect from an acceptable risk perspective, then you can use that to have them instantiate that through policy. And absolutely, then the whole security program drives from that. So I think you have to start with a seed of a program, and that leads to policies, and that leads to the rest of the program. Yeah, thanks, Greg. There's also a, a kind of related question from D about we are seeing more individual client cybersecurity mandates and requirements. It's impossible to manage corporate and individual mandates as well as vendors. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's certainly related to a lot of the supply chain um, concerns that, that many of you raised. Um, and as Adam mentioned, you know, we tried to increase the supply chain considerations in the last version of the framework. That was some of the largest changes that we made in version 1.1, but we're, we're, we're considering kind of how to beef that up for 2.0. I think the, the nice thing about the framework is you can um, map in different requirements under each of the cybersecurity framework kind of categories and subcategories, each of those outcomes. Um, for there are a couple of um, um, standards and regulations in which the framework is mapped to that make it a little bit easier. If they're financial regulations and financial sector specific standards, you know, CI, CRI has mapped those different requirements um, under their profile that they've developed for the framework. Um, and, and so there's there's probably um, um, some sort of mapping out there that, that can that can maybe help you get part of the way um, to kind of piecing together the, the full um, cybersecurity risk management strategy for your organization that would include, you know, um, um, what your organization wants to do. And, and there may be multiple strategies within one organization, you know, different programs, different departments may have different interests, um, as well as being able to map in, you know, what, what, um, what your customers are, are looking for, what your um, um, kind of vendors are looking for, as well as what your regulators might be looking for. Um, that's, that's, I think, one of the, the nice things about the framework is because it was written in an outcome specific fashion, it helps to serve as kind of the umbrella um, framework for organizations to incorporate many different, more specific cybersecurity mandates and requirements. So, um, um, that's also an area where I think that um, we, we did hear a lot in comments under the RFI about, you know, how do we develop a profile? How do we do that? How do we do that mapping? Um, um, and so we are looking to consider additional guidance on how to develop a cybersecurity framework profile um, that, that tailors the framework to your specific organization. If you, if you think that would be helpful, um, we'd, we'd be happy to hear, you know, what you know, what, what challenges you guys are facing with respect to um, using the framework in that matter. Just, just to add on that a little bit, I mean, I think we talked about over here a little bit, um, online informative references, and I think part of that is to try to eventually try to get us, and I know we've been, people have been talking about this for a long time with, um, you know, implement once, comply many. Um, uh, the OLEAR database, you know, will, will kind of show the relationships between these different controls. And I think longer term, we're hoping that when these new requirements are developed, that it can be based on things like OLEAR. So we're not constantly reinventing the wheel 
or using terminology that's just different enough that it's a little confusing if it relates to the terminology that is used somewhere else. Um, it, so th that is one opportunity we have, and as Sherry mentioned, uh, the, the focus on outcomes um, has uh, the cybersecurity framework has helped a little bit in these areas. We we we, we suspect, um, you know, even large organizations are often their security programs looks like they're just a collection of small and medium businesses where they have their own plans and programs, and maybe every once in a while they get together and talk about what their goals are as an organization. Um, so. Um, I think you know we continue to use the kind of ubiquity of the cybersecurity framework and the fact that it is truly sector and organization agnostic to try to help organizations look across and say, um, since you are reliant on companies in different sectors with different legal and regulatory requirements, the CSF is a tool to say, oh, you're an ISO shop, we use NIST. Oh, you have to comply with uh, the this this FERC guidance. Well, we don't have to do that. We're not electric. Uh, we're not an energy company. But if you can look past that and say, okay, but what are the overall objectives and what are the security considerations? Um, then you can have a more meaningful conversation. Um, but we, you know, we understand it's still very difficult. We we do hear that quite a bit. Um, so it is something that we're hoping. Uh, through the update and through these other programs that we have that we can really help to streamline and to the fullest extent possible if we can use uh, machine languages make it so that you can use your GRC tools and so it becomes even more seamless you don't have to have a human in the middle trying to interpret how these things relate um, because that's the other issue we see where someone developed the mapping a long time ago and then that mapping becomes authoritative and then you'll go back a few years later and say, oh, this wasn't exactly right. Like these two things don't completely align in the way that I thought they did. Um, so those are all things that we think we can, we can begin to try to socialize and address and an update and through these other programs. Does anybody else on the team have any other questions they want to walk through or any comments they want to respond to before we wrap up? I mean, I think Dennis had an interesting question about um, kind of requirements around geographic location. Um, we, you know, we do have some work on trusted cloud at the at our National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence that does look at things like geo secure geolocation in the cloud. Um, that might be a resource. Um, we also, you know, do work with the policy community when there are specific requirements for geolocation, um, especially with uh, within FedRAMP for the um, USG. Um, uh, so, you know, there are ways of doing it. I think we do have recommendations on the particular controls you need to look at. Um, and I need to know a little more information to, to really respond to that question, but, but maybe we can follow up uh, offline. Dennis. Yeah, I think that's all I you know, all of the, the comments that you all have shared and the questions have been really helpful to us. It's, it's really, um, um, really appreciate you guys being willing to share those. And, and it's clear that, you know, there are certain things that are um, um, resonating with many of you, you know, things like supply chain security and ransomware and cloud computing. Um, those are also areas in which, you know, we're gonna be focusing a lot of time on um, as we kind of move to update the framework and as well as, you know, I, I think I, I mentioned at the beginning, like the RFI that we started with this process was meant to look at all of our cybersecurity resources. And so, um, you know, if there's areas where we need to develop more guidance that's separate from the framework, we plan to do that too. 
Um, so really appreciate your time today. Um, if you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to reach out at, at cyberframework at nist.gov. That's um, the, the people behind that email alias are us. Um, so um, don't be surprised if one of us actually responds, um, but, but feel free to send questions, you know, check out the ways in which um, you can participate on the CSF 2.0 update on the NIST cybersecurity framework website, as well as all of the different resources that we have available to implement the framework on that website. Um, so thanks so much for your time today. Um, we really do appreciate it. And, and thanks for the questions and the comments. Um, and with that, um, I think we will end the event. Thanks so much. Thank you very much to everybody who participated. Uh, and thank you to our NIST partners. Uh, no better uh, friend in the US government uh, than NIST uh, for us, uh, as far as the uh, patience and ongoing iterative processes you have uh, to make cybersecurity uh, as ideal as possible. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for all the attendees. Have a wonderful day.